That's the problem. Thank you for joining us this evening. You were brought into the session with your microphone and video off. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Megan will collect them and address them to Robert after his presentation. The program will be recorded and it will be made available on Detroit Public Library's YouTube channel and through Wayne State University's website. I am Jennifer Dye, a librarian at Detroit Public Library. We've had astronomy programs for several years. Before 2020, we had in-person programs. When things fell apart, we put the programs on hiatus and we launched on Zoom in early 2021. And we've been very fortunate to work with Megan McCullen, director of Wayne State University Planetarium. She helps out with the Zoom programs and she has been providing a link to the community of Wayne State University faculty and alumni. So I'd like to ask Megan to speak briefly before I introduce tonight's speaker. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone, for joining us from all around the world. I just saw we have someone from China here as well. So Happy New Year uh, to, uh, to them. Uh, and uh, we're really glad to participate. Happy to be here. And we I'll post a link in the uh, chat as well. The Wayne State University Planetarium has started hosting our free public planetarium shows again in person on Friday evenings. Uh, of most weeks. We have one show per month that is for Wayne State students and faculty specifically, uh, but the rest of our shows are free and uh, you can reserve seats a week in advance on Eventbrite. So I will post the link to that there and I'll post a link to our student shows as well. Uh, we should have other events coming up, so stay tuned for those. But the main thing is uh, we're back under the dome and we're really excited to be there and would love to have any of you come join us uh, for a night under the imaginary stars. <laughs> Since we do have a lot of light pollution uh, in Detroit, so sometimes it's easier to see certain things in the planetarium um, before you head outside. Uh, and so yes, I'll be monitoring the chat. Uh, so if you have any questions for Robert during the show, please feel free to post them there and I will organize them and uh, ask them of him at the end of the show. Thank you, Jennifer, for including us and for hosting these great events. Well, I appreciate your work and uh, the work of all of our presenters. Our presenter tonight is Robert Parrish. He is VP of Cass County Parks and Recreation Department and he is a delegate to the International Dark Sky Association. He was the motive force behind the effort for Dr. Lawless Park to receive its certification as an international dark sky park. He grew up during the space race of the 60s and received a telescope from Santa at age eight. Hmm. Uh, since that time, he's been hooked on staring at the stars. He believes that Mother Nature's beauty does not have to end with the setting sun and that protecting that beauty starts with educating the public on the many negative effects light pollution presents to human and environmental health. The presentation, this presentation will focus on identifying the different types of light pollution and how to combat it so we can help protect Michigan's dark skies. Robert, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to speak to everybody tonight. It's definitely an honor. And as just stated by Jennifer, my name is Robert Parrish. And I'm going to uh, share my screen right now. Can everybody see that? Looks great, but it's still in your uh, yep. the view where we can see all your slides. We're going to change that right now. Well, it's not doing that. So let me try one more time. Choose Here. slideshow? Let's do slideshow okay. from beginning. And it's not doing anything. <laughs> of course not. We can do this anyway. You can do this. Uh, you can see it, can't you? It's not going to be as big as we want it to, but it's going to work. I can see a little drop down under the word design where it says you can click on resume slideshow. Maybe that's what it needs to do. 
There we go. Hey, there it goes. Hey, good catch. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No problem. All right, we're here to talk about light pollution today, and um, we will get started. As probably you're tired of hearing already, my name is Robert Parrish. I'm the Vice President of the Cass County Parks and Recreation Department. I'm a delegate to the International Dark, Dark Sky Association. I received my master's and bachelor's from Western Michigan University. I'm a proud bron Bronco, and as we like to say among, amongst Broncoites, every day is a great day to be a Western Michigan University Bronco. And on top of that, I am a certified dyed in the wool, hard carrying astro nerd. And if you doubt that fact, I'm going to take you back a few years to 1963. And I woke up, I looked under the Christmas tree, and lo and behold, Santa Claus had brought me a telescope. And that's my dad in the back, by the way. And my dad is the reason, uh, or was my goal, I guess you could say, for getting um, Lawless Park recognized as a dark sky park. I lost my dad about three years ago. He was the best dad any kid, kid could ever hope for. Uh, he loved looking at the stars, and we spent a lot of time outside in rural Cassopolis, Michigan, uh, fighting off mosquitoes in the summertime, looking through that telescope, sometimes not even knowing uh, what we were looking at, but it was great just uh, sharing that time with my dad. But since that time, I've kind of uh, upgraded my equipment. This is my rig now, a little bit different than what I had back in 1963. It's what they call a catadioptric telescope. And uh, most amateur photographers just call them cats for short. So if you uh, hear anybody who's ever talking about a Schmidt Cassegrain or a catadioptic telescope, this is what it looks like. Now I own two cats. This cat is great for looking at the stars. And this cat, not so much. This is Rosie the cat. Uh, she might make an appearance in here tonight because she is definitely nosy Rosie. As they say, curiosity makes the cat. And she's got to be the most uh, curious, nosy cat you can imagine. But uh, even despite that, she's a really good kitty and she keeps me company at night when I'm out underneath the stars. And when you have dark skies like we do at Lawless Park, and you have the right type of equipment like I showed you earlier, you can take pictures like this. This is the Wizard Nebula taken from the park. We also have the uh, North America Nebula. Uh, the Ghost Nebula, which is the same picture that's uh, behind me in my background. And in honor of the upcoming Valentine's Day, this is called the Heart Nebula. But uh, I'm digressing from uh, our purpose to be here tonight, which is light pollution. And the main points that I want to get across is what is light pollution? How do we mitigate it? Outdoor lighting and crime and promoting dark skies.
Okay. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. We're going to have several of these short videos through e the- Excuse uh, me, Robert, this is Jennifer. Um, I noticed that the video gave a credit for music and I didn't hear any, and I, at least one other person didn't. So I don't yeah, know if something I, went wrong. I think the audio wasn't playing. Um, but it, it's not it, it's not disastrous. I just wanted you to know. Could you uh, hear the narration? Nope. <laughs> no. And I, I, so I looked it up and I think uh, there's just a little thing on the share screen. There should be um, a share sound in the bottom left corner of the share selection window uh, is what it's telling me, but I don't know if that's something that you see somewhere. But I don't have a share screen here anymore. I don't see where it says. Okay. Let me go back. Close out. Let me see if I can. I thought maybe it was that. I mean, it still was useful. Like. Sometimes you pay more attention to the visuals, but. Uh, okay, if I stop the share, then I can go in and uh, it says share sound. Hey, uh -huh. so do you want to do it over again? <laughs> it probably wouldn't hurt. It was a pretty okay. short one, just. Um, yes, and, and I'm sure there was useful information. Okay, um, let me bring things back up here. Don't you love technology? <laughs> Technology always makes our lives easier. Yes. Okay. Now, we're going to go past all this. And you're not sharing your screen yet, so. All righty. I'm out now. Can you see the screen? So yeah, it's back to you showing it with your slides and not just okay. the slideshow. But yeah. We're gonna go to here. Yeah. Go slideshow from current slide. There. All right. Is. All right. We have a video coming up this time, and hopefully this time, with the magic of uh, redoing things and. Uh, excusing somebody who's nearly 70 years old trying to figure out a computer. Uh, we are going to play the video again. I'm sorry for any inconvenience. Hopefully this has audio to it. We live on the surface of a planet, spinning on its axis once every 24 hours. Its rhythms of day and night are embedded in the biological makeup of all life. During the day, we bathe in the glow of the sun. As night approaches, darkness takes over. It's a time to rest, to rejuvenate, to marvel at the beauty of the night. Until just over a century ago, our night skies were very dark. Now, even the wilderness is invaded by light. Our cities glow at night. Buildings are lit up. Unshielded lights blind us as we travel along our streets and roads. All these artificial lights overpower the darkness. The 
the waste of energy is obvious, even from space. Much of that yellow glare the astronauts see comes from streetlights. They produce most of the light pollution on the planet. The glare is scattered by the atmosphere, creating sky glows over the landscape. We are losing the dark of night at the speed of light. Light pollution threatens the health of every living thing on Earth. Lights at night disrupt plant growth. Unshielded lights contribute to the deaths of countless land and sea animals each year. Migrating birds crash into illuminated buildings. Newly hatched sea turtles mistake the glow of electric lights for the shimmer of the ocean's surface. Bright lights at night also directly affect humans. Drivers and pedestrians temporarily blinded by poorly designed lights have suffered tragic accidents. Light pollution poses a silent threat to our health. Exposure to light at night disrupts the circadian rhythms that regulate our sleep cycles. People working at night under bright lights or living in light-polluted cities face a higher risk of developing diseases such as breast and prostate cancer. Here is a night sky with typical light pollution. On a good night, only the brighter stars and planets pierce the glow. This is what the night sky might look like if we could remove the light pollution. That faint band of light stretching across the sky is the Milky Way, our home galaxy. Because of light pollution, many people have never seen it. Astronomers know all too well the problems caused by lighting up the night. They need clear, dark skies to study the many fascinating objects in the universe. Light pollution simply washes out their view of the cosmos. Lighting up the night sky wastes money and fossil fuels. To keep a 100-watt light bulb turned on every night for a year, takes the equivalent energy output from burning half a ton of coal. Multiplied by the billions of lights blazing up from Earth, the cost of energy we use to light up the night is colossal. While lighting is needed, there are some simple things we can do to ensure that it's neighborhood friendly, energy efficient, and helps preserve dark skies. We can replace light fixtures that send light up to the sky with ones that direct light down, exactly where we want it. They're called fully shielded fixtures. We can also illuminate only the places that need it. And of course, we can just turn off unnecessary lights. These are smart ways to use lighting. They offer simple solutions to problems caused by light pollution. We have a choice between wasting resources by sending light to the sky or learning to use light more responsibly. Light pollution is a problem each of us can help solve. Together, we can bring back the dark of night to planet Earth. Okay, I'm back. How did we do that time? Did we have audio? We had great. audio. I think it was great. And okay. I added a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like to break I like to break light pollution down into three categories: light trespass, sky glow, and over illumination. Those are the three categories that I use. And here's a good example of light trespass, the definition being light that is cast where it's not wanted or needed. 
And I kind of like to think of it as unwanted light that crosses uh, property lines. A good example of that might be this illustration. The guy on the left think he's, thinks he's doing his neighbor and possibly the whole neighborhood a favor by installing that giant yard buster light. But to the guy on the right, he's just trying to get a good night's sleep. And uh, he'd like to go over there, rip that light off the wall and possibly put it someplace where the sun can't get to it. But uh, the guy on the left finally uh, realized the, uh, the ways of his uh, light were not correct. And so he put in a fully shielded light, shines it down on the ground where that's where he intended it to be in the first place. And the guy on the right can now get a good night's sleep. Sky glow. Uh, this particular picture was taken south of South Bend, Indiana, looking north. And if you didn't know better, you might think the city was on fire. Uh, but that's all what they call uh, sky glow, the part of light pollution that lights up the sky. And uh, you would think, uh, who cares? You know, what difference does it make? But it takes a lot of electricity to produce all that wasted light. And of course, that adds to our carbon footprint and is bad for human health and also uh, environmental health. And sky glow is light from poorly designed fixtures that escapes vertically and reflects off particles such as air pollution, water vapor, and dust in the air. I imagine you have a lot of sky glow in the Detroit area. And then you have over illumination, which equals too many lights. Uh, this doesn't look like too bad of an apartment complex, maybe a condo in the summertime when the snow is gone. Uh, you can sit outside and bask under the warm glow of man-made light. And good luck trying to get sleep at light at night unless you have blackout curtains on your windows because those look like a, some pretty uh, bright lights with a lot of glare. And um, the problem with this glare and these uh, harsh areas of light, uh, criminals know that that creates a big contrast between light areas and shadow areas and shadow areas is you are where they usually hide out at. Uh, here's a good example. At top, you have a, um, a wall pack light, creates a lot of glare. It's not shielded. All that's coming right into your eyes like an oncoming car that won't turn off its brights. But when you shield that, in this particular slide below, he's just putting his hand over the light. All of a sudden, you can see the guy on the other side of the gate. So how do we fight light pollution? Um, learn what good lighting is. Hopefully we're gonna do that today. If so, make intelligent outdoor lighting changes. Determine if you are guilty of poor lighting choices because it's hard for you to tell somebody else that uh, their light is incorrect when you're making a mistake yourself. And what are good lighting practices? Now I have another video coming up next and possibly, quite possibly, this will be the most corny video you'll ever see in your life. It was uh, recorded and produced by some um, park rangers, national park rangers at Theodore Roosevelt National Park, which I believe is in Montana, maybe Wyoming, I'm not sure. And then it's but, North uh, Dakota. Pardon? North Dakota. North Dakota, okay. Um, even though it is a corny video, it really gets to the point and it gives some really good education on how to uh, mitigate light pollution. If you saw our other videos, you learned how night lighting and light pollution are impacting animals and actually ruining our views of the night sky. Yeah, but seriously, we need lights at nighttime because they help keep us safe, right? Well, sort of. Actually, one of the major problems is ineffective lighting. Take this one, for example. It was designed to look pretty good in a kind of 70s groovy style during the daytime. But what happens at night? Whoa! <laughs> All right, it's night, but it's also raining. Uh, want a jacket? Oh, sure. <laughs> Thanks, <Jacket>. Jeff. <laughs> OK. Well, as you can see, the light is now on, and its purpose is one thing and one thing only, to illuminate the ground so I can see where I'm going. 
Unfortunately, you can see that only about 50% of that light is actually doing that. 10% is shining right into your eyes, and the other 40% is just going straight into the night sky. And unless we're looking to light up leaves and the undersides of birds' bellies, that's just totally wasted light. I know, let's talk about glare and safety for a moment. Let's use this light here as an example. This light shines directly into our eyes. Its glare causes our pupils to contract, blinding us to the darkness. Wow, the glare is really bad. Yeah, it's like car headlights blinding you at night. But in this case, we can fix it. So if we shield this light so that all of the light is pointing on the ground. Wow, that's a lot better. Our eyes relax a little bit, our pupils start to dilate, and we can see everything in the dark, including the scary looking guy who's been hiding out in the shadows this whole time. I liked <laughs> Oh my gosh, I had no idea he was hiding there. <laughs> so why do we have these style lights in our parks? Well, it's the same reason you've got them in your towns and your cities, and that's because nobody thought about it when they were designing them. But we're thinking about it now, and we're striving to make changes to help fix our lighting and bring back our dark nights. Oh, have you heard of the International Dark Sky Association? They're an organization dedicated to protecting the night skies. We plan on working with them to fix our lights. If we all work together, the savings are huge. Since nearly half of all lights in the U.S. point upwards, we waste an estimated $3 billion of electricity each year. Saving money, protecting wildlife, and bringing back the Milky Way, that's what I call a win-win-win situation. So what are we waiting for? So what are we waiting for? No, you're the one who's waiting. Who's waiting here? I'm not waiting. Let's go! All right, uh, who thought that was a corny video? <laughs> That one part in there where she was talking about uh, illuminating the undersides of birds' bellies, it uh, brings back a story I'd like to share with the audience. I, in my At my house, behind my house, I have an open field, and sometimes I go out there at night to look through my telescope, and there was one particular night where these thin clouds started to come in, so I sat down in my chair, just listening to the radio, hoping the clouds would pass so I can get back to my astronomy. And all of a sudden, something caught my eye uh, in my peripheral vision, and I looked, and it was about seven or eight glowing dots in the sky in a V formation, and it was making absolutely no sound whatsoever, and it was just gliding in, gliding in, getting closer and closer, getting lower and lower, and I kept looking at it and shaking my head and looking back at it again. And uh, I've always had people ask me, do I see anything weird at night as far as UFOs? Do I believe in aliens? That sort of thing. And I'm sitting there looking at it thinking, my gosh, am I actually seeing a UFO? Is this really happening to me? And all of a sudden, this V shape as it got lower started going honk, honk. And I realized it was a flock of geese coming into a pond not too far away from my house, getting ready to sleep for the night. And uh, their white bellies were reflecting the light pollution coming up from our street lamps. So talk about feeling like a complete idiot. And that was me. And here we have an example of really bad lighting um, on the uh, left and good lighting on the right. And you can see on the right that that's a fully, uh, fully shielded fixture. All the light is being focused down on the ground. That's where you want it in the first place and uh, fully shielded fixtures are best. And uh, they're getting more and more popular, especially in the big box stores like Lowe's, Menards, and uh, Home Depot. And so always make sure you try and get a fully shielded light. The light is targeted where you need it, but what about the light source itself? Well, of course, nowadays, the best type of lighting is LED lighting because it's the most energy efficient energy efficient, but there's a downside to that because people are looking at lights thinking, hey, before I had an incandescent 100 watt floodlight on the back of my house, I'm going to replace it with LED lighting 
which will save me money. As a matter of fact, I can get twice as powerful a light as what I had before and still save money. I'm going to get the bigger light. Well, that is stupid. Uh, even if it's a fully shielded light, you're not um, using what you need. Only light what you need. Don't get anything too bright. Make sure it is a fully shielded fixtures so you're not bothering your neighbors. You're helping the environment and you're also helping human health. It's also important that you get lights that are 3000 Kelvin or less. As a matter of fact, it's even better if you can get 2700 Kelvin or less. And usually when you buy a light, you look on the side of the package and it will tell you what the Kelvin or color temperature of the light is. Remember, you always want 3000 K or less and that's because anything above that threshold is rich in blue light wavelengths which is a very small, very short, very powerful wavelength. And it has the ability to scatter and defeat the purpose of a uh, fully shielded fixture. And that's why the sky is blue on a nice sunny day because the blue wavelength light has the ability to scatter and fill up the sky. And blue rich lights are bad for your health, not only human health, but environmental health. And if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe the president of the American Medical Association. This next video is something that was taken from a news report at a uh, Cincinnati news station. As night falls on the tri-state, a new brighter, whiter light is beginning to shine. Light emitting diodes or LEDs are at the center of these new street lights. The LEDs produce more light using half the electricity of those old familiar high pressure sodium lights. The lower cost bright light combo is why LEDs are now popping up on our roads and streets, byways and highways, even in a tunnel many of you drive through. According to the Ohio Department of Transportation, approximately 1,100 LEDs now make up the 46,000 streetlights on state roads and highways. But the nation's largest group of physicians, the American Medical Association, is now warning about a potential darker side to these LED lights. It's not a good thing. Bottom line, right? That's correct. AMA President Dr. Andrew Gurman agreed to talk with me from Altoona, Pennsylvania. Dr. Gurman believes the light emitted by these diodes can be downright hazardous. According to this official AMA report, many of the new street lights could be considered unshielded LED lighting, which could be creating a road hazard. Does that worry you just from the ability to drive your car in and out of these lights at night? Well, yes, it does. Dr. German and the AMA say the potential hazard on the roads is caused by both the brightness and color of the new LED lights. Most of the LED street lights emit 4,000 Kelvins or 4,000 K. Now the 4,000 K lights are the ones that you've seen on some, some car headlights coming at you. And just like that car coming at you, the AMA report states, the same amount of light overhead can be very blue and very blinding. They are uh, about 29% blue light, which you can't see, but that light rattles around inside your eyeballs, particularly as you get older. Um, and that blue light can be very harmful. It causes glare. The AMA calls it disability glare an impairment that the report says causes a veil of illuminance, which leads to worse vision than if the light never existed at all. In other words, in some cases with LED street lights, the AMA report states you'd be better off driving in the dark. Those are strong words. Well, that's what's in the report. So I want you to think about that. These blue rich lights that are being put up all over the place, According to the AMA, that might be worse than having not any lights at all. So think about that. And everything that we use today, telephones, um, our TV sets, computers, street lights, they're all rich in blue rich lighting and they're very detrimental to human health. Now, the biggest pushback I always get when I give this presentation 
is light pollution as related to crime. And I've done a lot of research on the subject, read a lot of reports. Uh, there are some reports that say, yes, extra light does reduce crime. And then there are reports that say the opposite. But the one thing I found out is that most of these reports that uh, support extra lighting to reduce crime are paid for and produced by either electric companies or lighting manufacturers, which of course wanna sell you more lights. So I think that kind of skews their results. But um, the guy we're gonna see next in our uh, next video likes to call himself the Dark Ranger. I'm not sure of his real name, but he is a professor at the University of Utah and he teaches light pollution. Yeah. Hi, I'm the Dark Ranger. Did you see me hide in there? Probably not, because this is a bad design for lighting. What we have here are hard shadows. They're created by the fact that this light post was placed right in the middle of two trees. Now, it's not a very good situation for safety because the bad guys know the human eye can't penetrate the hard shadows. So that's where you hide and set up an ambush. And of course, the best thing is the psychology. Next to a light, people think they're safe. So they're gonna have their guard down. It's a dangerous situation. It's also not very good for the trees themselves because in fact, trees use the number of hours of continuous darkness to tell them what season of the year it is. You can kind of think of like darkness being a calendar for trees. And I would guess that these trees probably blossom a little bit too early in the spring Maybe they have to deal with a hard, cold snap, and they probably hang onto their leaves a little bit too late in the fall, all compromising the health of the tree, reducing its ability to grow, things like that. Now, of course, on a university campus, like we are here at the University of Utah, the health of the trees is not gonna be our first concern. It's mostly going to be about public safety, but this is a classic example of where it's not the amount of light or even the amount of watts, a fairly powerful fixture you see there, but it's about making smart lighting. Smart lighting outsmarts the bad guys and makes your neighborhoods or campuses a safer place to be. Okay, the one study that I thought uh, was very interesting was a study on light as it's related to crime that was um, put on by a major university in the city of London, England. And what they did is they took two neighborhoods that uh, demographically were almost exactly the same as far as population, age, income, and crime. So in the one neighborhood, they left that as the control neighborhood. They didn't do anything to it. In the second neighborhood, they made a point of putting up hundreds of maybe thousands of extra lights all around the neighborhoods, alleyways, streetways, to try and see if all these extra lights would show quantitatively that there is a reduction in crime. And they let the study go for uh, five years. And after five years, they compiled all the data. This was a very good empirical study. And they found out that the neighborhood with all the extra lights put into it, crime actually went up and it went up significantly and they couldn't figure this out. You know, what went wrong? Because common logic, even though it's kind of mistaken, is that more lighting equals less crime. But in this case, it didn't. So they thought about it and they thought about it, they brainstormed and they couldn't come up with a theory or a hypothesis as to why this is true. So as a last resort, they went to some of the criminals they managed to apprehend in that particular neighborhood and they asked them, why did you choose this neighborhood over the other neighborhood? And they said, well, we felt safer because of all the extra light. So I wonder if that's what people are doing all the time. They just feel safer with the extra light. They don't, they're not necessarily any safer. Uh, 
but improper lighting at night creates hard shadows and glare that masks a criminal presence. And so you should always use intelligent lighting that minimizes shadow and glare and consider motion sensors or even timers on your lights. Because think of it this way. Um, I have a guy across the street from me who has a beautiful, beautiful hot rod in his garage. And every time he backs that sucker out, I start salivating like Pavlov's dog. It's a beautiful car. But he's got his garage lit up like a, a penitentiary at night. So I went to talk to him about it one day and he said, hey, I can't turn off the lights. I've got this beautiful hot rod out in my garage. And I said, I realized that. I said, but do you stay up all night looking out the window to see if anybody's breaking into your garage? He said, of course not. I got to get up and go to work in the morning. And I said, so how would you know if anybody's out there? Because in effect, the guy doesn't, if you're a criminal, you don't even have to carry a flashlight anymore. You got an extra hand to work with. So you're just providing a work work light for the nefarious inclined. And now a statement brought to you from our collective mom, Mother Nature. Global warming. I know this is a politically charged statement, a politically in charged uh, subject, but uh, I tend to side with science on this. Global warming is a problem. And uh, Light pollution creates a lot of pollution because of all the extra electricity used to create that light. Uh, outdoor lighting uses 120 terawatts hours of energy, which equals 10 million tons. I think maybe they meant barrels of oil. Uh, unshielded lights waste about 30% of outdoor lighting, equivalent to 3.3 billion or $10 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. And waste from bad lighting releases as much as CO2 as 3 billion passenger cars would. And we would need to plant 875 million trees every year just to offset that waste. So in review, we now know that light pollution can be segmented into uh, light trespass, sky glow, and overillumination. We know that fully shielded lights, implementing warm color LED lights, 3000 Kelvin or less, are the best options. And why is that? Because they're not blue rich lighting. As for crime and outdoor lighting, we know people feel safer with night lighting just make intelligent lighting choices because as a um, delicate to the IDA, we are not advocating that you get rid of outdoor lighting because that would be impossible. We're too modern of a society to get rid of all outdoor lighting. But uh, keep your lights, just make sure they're intelligent lighting, make sure they're fully shielded, they're a warm color temperature, only use them when you have to and consider timers and uh, motion detectors. And we know that light pollution uh, impacts personal health, waste energy, money, adds to global warming and threatens environmental health. And I think I skipped one. As for crime and outdoor lighting, we know people feel safer with night lighting. Just make intelligent lighting choices. And if you're still not sold, the stars have a great sales pitch. This picture you see here was taken by one of the visitors to Dr. Lawless. Uh, Dark Sky Park. The photographer was a Jason Beauchere. And this was a simple, uh, according to him, a 25 second exposure. You can see the Milky Way. And right above the tree, right almost in the middle, you can actually see the Andromeda Galaxy. And if that doesn't sell you on uh, curbing light pollution, I don't know what will. Also, with the expansion of uh, light pollution, because it seems to get worse every year. Astrotourism is on the rise because most people have never seen a star's filled sky. And at Dr. Lawless Park, even though we're in the southwest corner of the state, the majority of visitors that we get at the park are either from the Metro Detroit area, the Grand Rapids area, or the Chicagoland area, because these people have never seen the Milky Way. They've never seen the stars like you can at the park. 
and our park isn't as dark as some of the parks up north in Michigan. But astroturism is on the rise. And being that in Michigan, one of the uh, leading industries in the state has always been tourism. Uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation recognizes that. They are the people that produce the uh, Pure Michigan ad campaigns featuring the voice of Tim Allen. And a few years ago, uh, they came up with this particular 30 second ad that ran in, uh, I think it was six national networks and in over 2000 movie theaters scattered across the Midwest. <laughs> I think Michigan is a very beautiful state. Of course, I'm prejudiced because of that, but um, it is a beautiful state. And uh, like Jennifer said at the beginning, I'm a firm believer that uh, the beauty of Mother Nature does not have to end when the sun goes down. Uh, some of the best artwork of the creator is at night. And I love this, uh, this little uh, illustration featuring Calvin and Hobbes. It says, if people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I bet they would live a lot differently. And I fully agree with that because whether you believe uh, we were put on this planet by an all powerful being, being or we're just here by pure scientific happenstance, there's no getting around the fact that we're all made of star stuff. And when we can't see the stars, we're not only wasting energy, we're not also harming environmental health, we're harming human health, but um, we're just taking away from that beautiful artwork. So I wanna thank you. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I guess I will uh, start fielding any questions if there are any. Well, thank you, Robert. Megan, are there some questions? Uh, not in the chat yet, but I have one. So sure. if other people have questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I'll take advantage of the opportunity. Um, I was actually just talking to someone the other day while we were driving about all of the car lights and wondering about changes in, as we've been changing the types of light bulbs, if that was part of the reason we were having such a hard time seeing. And it sounded from that video like that is the case. I don't know if that's something that's come up. I know you're focused more on street lights, but. Um, no, no, that's true. As a matter of fact, uh, there, there are quite a few advocates out there that, um, I don't want to say specialized, but they put an emphasis on car headlights because that does add to uh, light pollution overall. And you'll notice um, with cars coming at you at night, the old type of lights have more of a yellowish tint to it. Yeah. And they're not as bad, but sometimes when you get those new LEDs and those, especially the expensive cars and they're coming at you and you can almost see that blue tint. Yeah. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm doing like this, like, Where's the side of the road? Because I don't want this guy to crash into me. Right. It's very blinding. And that's the same type of blue light that uh, is being put up in street lights because municipalities uh, here in Edwardsburg, I'll give you a good example. <clears throat> I'm trying to get um, the village to adopt a lighting ordinance. And uh, they've been pretty receptive about it so far, not much pushback, but the president called me one day and said, hey, I just got a letter from our electric provider in this area, which is um, AEP. And uh, they said, they're gonna come into town if we want, and they're gonna change out all the lights to LEDs. Well, as it works here in this town, AEP owns the fixtures, but the village pays for the electric bill on them. Okay. So the village is thinking, man, you can put whatever you want up there as far as we're concerned for LEDs, because that's going to save us a ton of money in electrical costs every year. Uh, but he wanted to ask me, says, uh, they said that they can give you fully shielded fixtures, with they, which they did do, but the lowest they can go in the color temperature is 4,000. And I said, well, you know, it's better than nothing. 
the problem is, is when they put up those lights, they used a subcontractor and they weren't very um, dutiful, I guess you could say, when they put up the lights, because some of them are kind of cattywampus. They're at an angle. They're not level. Mm -hmm. So even if it's turned, let's say, this way, somebody driving this way, it's not a problem. But when you're driving this way and that tilted light, it's coming right into your eyes. So it's not only uh, a fully shielded fixture and the proper color temperature and the proper wattage for whatever you're going to use it for, but make sure you install it correctly too. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Because I tend to ramble a little bit. It does. And yeah, it's just something that I was thinking of. We were trying to figure out, you know, we're like, are we getting older or is it just oh, yeah. the same way that you have the red lights, you know, when you're looking at the sky as an astronomer, so your pupils don't dilate, but with those bright blue lights, then my pupils are dilating and then it's hard to readjust when you get to a darker place and see the lines on the road. And I was like, am I old or is it the lights or is it both? Yeah, um, it's, it's a little bit of all the same. Yeah. The older yeah. you get, the uh, less tolerant, I guess you could say your eyes are. Right. Because you, you start to develop a little bit of cataracts with time and it just bothers you. Of course, the older I get, a lot of things bother me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's... Um, yeah, that's the other thing I've been thinking about with the blue light was wondering about pupil dilation, like they said, for seeing people in the dark and things like that when you're looking at those areas, just the, the tone of the light. So that was really interesting about the um, trying to go for under 2700. And um, I, here in Michigan, I'm trying hard, um, writing representatives, senators, and even the governor. I would love to see a statewide outdoor lighting ordinance. There are a lot of counties and townships throughout the state that have adopted the same, but I'd like to get it at a state level. And if you'd like to learn more about light pollution, um, the IDA website is a great place to go. Uh, we have a new IDA chapter here in Michigan called Dark Sky Michigan. Uh, it is being uh, led by a person that I think is still here. Yeah, Robin Portine. And you can get on her website. And I would thoroughly encourage you to uh, follow the webpage and her Facebook page. It's full of great information, especially on astronomy and everything light polluted here in the state of Michigan. Um, we got another question. Um which is how are the electric companies getting away with upgrading street lights when we know that this is unhealthy, unsafe, and wasteful? You gave the example from your town, but it sounds like somebody else is having some issues too. But um, I think the problem, Megan, is that um, a lot of the negativities associated, associated with current LEDs uh, wasn't so much out in the open when these electric companies went out and bought thousands mm. of LED lights in anticipation of changing out the current or the older lights. And so they were stuck with them once they bought them. Mm. And that's what happened here in Michigan or here in Edwardsburg, I should say, because when the village president got the notice that, hey, we're going to come in your town and change the LEDs. Do you want us to do it? They're like, heck yeah, we want to save money. Right. Um, the problem is they didn't give them a choice. As a matter of fact, well, they did give them the choice. They said, either you do it or you don't. And if you don't, we'll only replace bad fixtures as they go out of service. If you choose that option, it might be 20 years down the road, down the road before all the fixtures are changed out. You know, and most municipalities want to save money right now. So they're saying, yeah, whatever you got, we'll take it. Uh, but I think the, the biggest problem is a lot of the negativities that it's being researched now and being associated with light pollution and the hazards that LEDs have wasn't known when there was an initial big push to manufacture LEDs. But now that is slowly changing and they're coming down in color temperatures. Unfortunately, LED lights last a really long time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a municipality, if they take the expense of changing out all the lights, they're not going to change them out again just to change the color temperature. So you're stuck with what you got for 20 or 30 years. Mm. Got it. Anything else? It's the only questions I've seen. Jennifer, do you have any other questions? I haven't seen any questions. 
Yeah. This is one of those great talks though, that gets me enthused again. I need this every couple of months to be like, yes, I need to go do this. So I really appreciate this talk. Um, yes. I got a lot out of it. Um, yeah. Um, gosh, you want to research this? I run a Facebook page called Dark Skies Matter. I have a lot of information on that. I'm always looking for new members to join that group. And we put a lot on our Facebook page for Dr. Lawless Dark Sky Part 2. And um, that's one of the things we had to do at the park to get our certification is to inventory all our current lights. And those lights had to be changed out to IDA approved lighting. And that's one part of the IDA website that you can go to because they have a list of manufacturers that do produce IDA approved lighting. And that would be a good place to go if you're considering changing out the light at your residence. And I posted earlier, but I'll post their website again in the chat for anybody who wants to find them. Um, oh, somebody else said they remember being able to see Milky, the Milky Way when they lived in Detroit in the city. Um, so they thought this was really interesting and they didn't know yeah. anything about LEDs. So I grew up in Cassopolis, which is about, um, I don't know, 10 miles north of where I live now. And, uh, where I grew up at, just outside of the town, outside of the village. Boy, excuse me. Um, matter of fact, that was a dirt road back in 1963, 64. And uh, boy, uh, when I was a kid, it looked like somebody took a whitewash brush and went from horizon to horizon mm -hmm. in the sky. It just stood out like there was no tomorrow. And uh, my dad was really into stargazing. He was in the Navy for a number of years. He was on an aircraft carrier <clears throat> in the early to mid 50s, uh, just a serviceman. Um, but uh, there was one pilot, I, I take that back because my dad would slap me. <laughs> Navy pilots aren't called pilots, they're called aviators. Yeah. So there was a naval aviator on board that would take enlisted man out at the deck at night and teaching the stars because back in those days, pilots had to navigate by the stars. That was way before GPS or modern day radar like they have now. And so my dad learned a lot of that when he was in the Navy and he says, you just wouldn't believe, uh, or he did say, you wouldn't believe how beautiful the night sky was from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a moonless night. Uh, because the ship for security reasons usually turned off their lights at night. And he said it was just absolutely gorgeous. It was breathtaking. He said, I just couldn't drink up enough of it. Every night I wanted to be out there to look at it. And I couldn't imagine it. Uh, I have a middle daughter that lives north of Petoskey. And uh, when we go up there to visit her, uh, that's dark enough where it's pretty much like I remember it as a kid. So many stars out at night that you can't even pick out your usual constellations like the Big Dipper. And so uh, if you've never been to a dark sky park, I would highly recommend it. If you choose uh, Dr. Lawless dark sky park to come to, uh, when you enter the gate, you'll be directed where to go. And I'm usually at the north end of the observing field with my telescope. I would love to show people some of the beautiful things you can see through it. And um, geez, I could ramble on and on and on, but... <laughs> I guess in the words of uh, John Lennon, when the Beatles performed on top of a roof in London, the last thing he said is, thank you for the uh, time today, and I hope we pass the audition. And that's that's my thought for today. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Don't let me down, people. I love uh, it. We have Lots quite a few comments. <laughs> Lots of people who really enjoyed it and said they learned a lot out of it. Uh, and somebody else, uh, Margaret, was talking about being able to see the Milky Way from Detroit in the old days. And I, I just sort of responded that right now you can't, but there are a lot of us who are, are looking at trying to improve um, lighting in Detroit. And we've been doing some telescope viewing out on Belle Isle with the Belle Isle Nature Center um, and working with them to um, look at what the lighting looks like out on the on the island and see if there are things we can do to improve that too. So um, we're, we're working on it. Um, yep. Yep. If you go to Petoskey at night, because Emmett, that's in Emmett County, and they have very strong outdoor lighting um, ordinances to help mm -hmm. protect 
the night sky for Headlands Dark Sky Park, which is part of Emmett County's park system. Mm -hmm. But you can be in downtown Petoskey at night and look up. You're not going to see the Milky Way, but you're going to see a ton of regular stars that you wouldn't see otherwise. Mm -hmm. So when you get outside of the, the city limits of Petoskey, it just starts to open up and whoa. And uh, the first time my wife saw it, I don't know, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, she was kind of afraid. She's like, what's that light in the sky? You know, I'm like, well, that's, is that the Northern Lights? I said, no, that's the Milky Way. You know, that's, and so it just boggles my mind about the universe and what small little specks of dust we are on the stage called the Milky Way. And uh, ah, as you can tell, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. <laughs> I don't want to take too much of your time because I know I'll probably only have an hour here. But uh, um, if anybody has any questions, um, we're happy to take idea. more questions. This recording should be on uh, the DPL uh, YouTube page in a few weeks. It takes a while to get up there. I put the uh, the link in the chat. Um, we're setting. I usually schedule astronomy programs on the fourth Tuesday of the month. And there, sometimes we need to change the date because of schedule conflicts. We're still developing our schedule for this year and we welcome suggestions uh, for, uh, for topics. We can't necessarily give them, but we'll try. <laughs> and uh, I do maintain an email list and I'm irregular about updating people, but I let them know about our programs and some of the other mailings that I get, including the ones that Megan sends. You know, so, I wouldn't mind hearing a talk at some point. It would have to be a combo maybe, but since we do have these different dark sky parks in the state, sort of a tour of the dark sky parks, where they are and and just learn a little bit about them and, and um, that would get me excited about making a road trip. <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah, Michigan was the first state in the union to, through legislation, create what they call Michigan Dark Sky Preserves. And I think there's eight of them currently throughout the state. Headlands and my park, Dr. Lawless Park, are not only international dark sky parks, we're also Michigan Dark Sky Preserves. There's two of them up by Alpena. Uh, there's one at Hudson Lake Hudson or Hudson Lake. There's one at Wilderness Park, which is north of Petoskey. Uh, so um, Michigan was the first state in the union to recognize the importance of protecting its night skies, probably mostly due to astrotourism and the possibility of helping that trade in the state, but still it's a positive move and uh, we're mm -hmm. getting better and better at it. And I think Michigan can be a leader in, in uh, helping to mitigate the problem of light pollution. Are there any dark sky preserves up in the upper peninsula you'd think so but no it, it's strange yeah. because when they came up with that register that uh, legislation um creating dark sky preserves they said it wasn't possible they made it so it wasn't possible to have one in the upper peninsula which just befuddles me because that's the darkest part of the state and why wouldn't you want one up there but there is an international dark sky park up at Copper Harbor now. They just got their certification this last June or July. Oh, great. At the, at the Keweenaw Mountain Lodge. And then Robin told me there's a land conservative, if I remember right, very close to that property that entails like 3,200 acres. And they're going to push that towards some sort of uh, dark sky recognition. So. Nice. And, so it's picking up steam and people are realizing it. And man, I, I think attendance at our park has been up almost twofold. Mm -hmm. We get visitors from all across the Midwest and we even get visitors from overseas who specifically come over <coughs> to visit dark sky parks. Little Cass County, you know, a very rural county. Uh, so we're very happy with the results so far. And I hope to see some of you out there. All right. Well, Robert, I may get in touch with you for suggestions on people to talk about the various dark sky parks in Michigan. That would be great. Okay. I think that's Sounds a good, good idea, Megan. And uh, if you do have suggestions that you want to send in, you can uh, send it to my email address here. And uh, thank you very much for attending tonight. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Great presentation. Thanks.
am, and thank you for the opportunity. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, everybody have a good night. I'm going to take off. Yes, thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.